2022 has been a dramatic year, especially for change. Russia has invaded the Ukraine. Queen Elizabeth II has passed. Charles is now king. Trump looks like is he's going to nominate for the 2024 presidency. Fauci has resigned his position as head of the NIHS. The world economy is on the brink of collapse. And Italy has just elected its first female leader. And here to discuss the world's changing events is our North American and European correspondent, the voice from Canada, Michael Chabon. Thank you, Michael. You're actually, your intro was right on point. I mean, poll numbers now continue to point to the Republicans are going to take a majority both in the Senate and in the House in America. Biden is still less than 39%, which is terrible popularity. He continues to make gaffes. And unfortunately, America now is realizing that his age is slightly catching up to him. And it's, and it's a very unfortunate circumstance where, where Americans are really seeing the rubber hitting the road is the economy is in trouble. Immigration is taking over the stock market. They, they lost, I think it was $2 trillion in the last six months. Inflation continues to go up. Interest rates, hard to get money, hard to borrow money. The threat of corporate taxes going up and this looming notion of a recession is powering a push for change and change just may happen in six weeks. And I haven't even talked about this no cash bail situation and, and the criminal ru ruin that's happened to many democratic cities. And, and now it's starting to become an immigration situation, which is becoming unavoidable. The Texas and the Florida governments have uh, put illegals on buses and they're sending them to the sanctuary cities, Michael. These were the ones on the bookends. You know, it was um, California and New York. Well, what the governors of Texas and Florida are doing is putting these uh, illegal immigrants and sending them on buses to New York and Washington, D.C. And those mayors are going, oh my God, we can't handle them. And the Washington DC mayor said that they had to bring in the National Guard. So it's interesting that they can't take a little bit of their own uh, medicine as one would say. Yeah, and the National Guard could have actually stopped them coming in at the border had they been that enthused to employ that method. Absolutely correct. Yeah, and I, I saw so some reporting about Martha's Vineyard. What a great place to uh, end up as a refugee. Well, interesting you should bring that up, Martha Desvenia. Now, you're talking about a, a really rich enclave. I mean, uh, the, the Obamas have a huge $40 million estate there. The Clintons used to be there. Even the Kennedys way back when. Mar Martha's Vineyard is a, is a little island off Massachusetts, and it's all the rich people. I mean, it's 96% it's more expensive than anywhere else in the United States. So, of course, Governor DeSantis from Florida and the governor from Texas decided, how are we going to tweak this immigration so more people are going to be made aware of it? Because the left wing media doesn't want to see immigration. They, they don't want to see all that. So they put 50 migrants on a bus and sent them to Martha's Vineyard. <laughs> Ironically, the press was there when the bus arrived. Can you imagine that? A reverse leak, as one would say. So all these people are all there crying and trying to help them and all oh, they were just so sorry and everything was going around and around. Well, I have to tell you, Michael, these immigrants, they lasted there for 24 hours before they put them on a bus and sent them to a, uh, a small base, uh, uh, basically a, a National Guard base. So it was interesting how at the end of it all, when they sent these migrants there again, uh, the 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 left wing can't take the medicine that they expect everybody else to take. And ironic that here we are, three million illegal Im immigrants have come through the southern border, totally open, and nobody said anything. But as soon as you send fifty to Martha's Vineyard, oh my goodness, then it's a big upset. <laughs> now, speaking of the the left and right divide, uh, Georgia uh, Maloney elected first female prime minister in Italy. Now that's huge. You got to think about that. She's uh, she is uh, at least first female uh, prime minister. That's quite an accomplishment. She's from the far right, a right wing person. Now there's all these people saying, "Oh, she comes from the the place of Mussolini," which is a ridiculous comparison. She is a little more far right. She's part of the Brothers of Italy party. Her stance, and this is what she won her election on. She said yes to natural families, but no to LGBT lobbyists. She said yes to sexual identity, but no to gender ideologies. Yes to secure borders and no to mass immigration. One of the other policies that she floated, which got her elected, was saying no to Brussels running Italy's government. Now, in Europe, you've got Spain, Italy, 
France, you've got Greece, all these countries are severely indebted, and they were floated money to keep the euro going. Italy is the second most indebted country in the EU. There's over $2 trillion that are going to come due in 2024. So what she wants to also do is put a blockade to stop the illegals from Syria and other countries uh, landing on Italy's shores because it's putting such a stress on both the economy and uh, the euro eventually. Uh, so Maloney cannot control the one thing that will be looming, and that's a potential recession coming to Europe, Michael. Yeah, we see a lot of reporting around this. We see the, the inflation getting out of control in a lot of countries. We see the American dollar rising on, on uh, other currencies falling. Where do you think this is going to end up, Michael? Well, so um, there are 19 countries that use the euro and the average price index has increased by almost 10%, 9.8, what's a couple of percentage points. That's a huge amount of money. When you think of all these people going through hardship, trying to get their claws back after this horrible pandemic. But now Russia is tightening fuel supplies. They're not you know, shipping fuels. They're, they're a little ticked off that everybody's still putting uh, restrictions against them. And there is a prediction that there's going to be a very hard winter. So it's going to be very di difficult for many people in Europe, not only to heat their house, but to be able to have enough money to put food on the table. It's becoming extremely desperate. And one final point here is, if you recall, Michael, back in 2016, 51% of the people in the UK voted for Brexit. They said they want Britain to leave the, the EU. The one thing that Britain always maintained was the pound. Like Switzerland, they maintained their own currency, which was the best thing that they ever could have done. It, it left them with that grace to be able to separate and maintain their own sovereignty. But now with Elizabeth Truss, who is uh, another female who's just been uh, elected to head uh, Britain, she's talking about paying for people's electrical bills, uh, um, doing lots more borrowing to try and prop up the UK. This has got financial analysts in, in a bit of a pickle, as one would say, because it may put some added pressure on the pound. The pound has direct influence on what's going to happen in Europe. Mm. So if you take what's happening with all the, all the machinations, as you call them, uh, with uh, uh, Russia, you look at uh, the European Union, that's uh, serious trouble. Lots of people owe a lot of money. A lot of people are borrowing. People are trying to get back on their feet again. Costs are rising. It's more expensive to borrow money. The UK is having problems. If it comes to pass that the Republicans do control the House and the Senate, which is a, a, a very good probability, the first thing they're going to do is they're going to make sure they're going to start producing gas. They're going to strengthen the American dollar, which means that the American dollar against the euro and against the pound will become much, much stronger and then empower America once again to be the economic engine to bring the world back from the pandemic. Mm. Now, some would say that's not necessarily a good thing. But uh, it may help tourism, it may help commerce, but I think Russia is still going to have a, a, a complete effect on this, Michael. But uh, hopefully, if we can just get the ball rolling, hopefully we can all pull ourselves out of the ditch, as they say. Yeah. And, and just to finish with, while we're in the UK, uh, we're firmly entrenched now in God Save the Queen, uh, God Save the King, the, the Queen is now officially laid to rest. What happens from here, Michael? Well, think about this. It was 1952 when Queen Elizabeth took over and basically was the first change from God Save the King, which was her father, King George VI, to God Save the Queen. Now the anthem has changed all the way back. It's God Save the King from the Queen. Uh, here we have some 70 years later, it's changing back to the King, King Charles III. So if, if, if you think about how... how the majority of us, all of us, will never see God Save the Queen again. Because think of um, how old folks are. King Charles III is now 74 years old. Camilla Queen Consort is 75. So William now um, acquired the Prince of Wales title. And they believe that one day when he becomes king, he's going to become William V. He's 40 years old right now. Um, uh, and if you recall back, I mean, I remember distinctly, I will never forget this as one of those imprints on your mind. He was 15 years old when Princess Diana was killed. 
15, and now he's 40. Uh, Princess uh, uh, Catherine, she's 40 years old. But here's the next generation, the next of, uh, of royals, right? Prince George of Wales is nine. Princess Charlotte, that would be a queen if anything, God forbid, was to happen to Prince George, is seven years old. And then Prince Louis of Wales is four years old. So it's interesting, I think, uh, Michael, we, we are seeing history created in front of us. And I just want to compliment the people of the UK, how classy they did that funeral with such respect. And the final point was um, Queen Elizabeth planned that funeral right down to the hearse. If you saw, it was a beautiful Jaguar. I'm a fan of Jaguars. This was a custom-made Jaguar with increased glass on the top and glass on the whole top. And basically, uh, uh, Queen Elizabeth said, the more they see, the more they believe. She will be missed. Um, but I think we're in a big change. And, and it's going to be interesting to see how other countries in the Commonwealth are going to change their money. They have to change their anthem. It'll be a change. But I think the king is still going to be God save the king for a couple of years. So it's going to be very interesting. Yeah, a massive historical event around the world that, uh, you know, we'll all remember. And before we go, Michael, I'll let, before I let you get back to your filming, how's the filming going on the film? Uh, it's called Cry of Silence. It's going absolutely wonderful. Director Alan Cool is doing a spectacular job. We did drone shots. Um, this is a dramatic thriller, and it's all about a serial killer and a woman who gets abducted, and it's, it's, it's wonderful. We're shooting it out of sequence, so you have to be very uh, respectful of the script, and Robin Crozier was the, uh, the writer of the script. Alan was uh, nominated for Best Director and Best TV Movie with the first film that he created called The Sanctuary, so I'm very privileged to be involved and be one of the executive producers and enjoying it. Day 17, we're almost done, but I wanted to connect with you and our folks in Australia, and I love the former michael so i really appreciate the opportunity to speak to you and exchange a little stuff it's really good i thank you for that great thanks for taking time out of your schedule michael and we'll see you next week thanks michael